Hello, and welcome to the You Are Love Ministry podcast with Pam Baggett and me, Brenda Porch. Now, this has been a very interesting study of heroes and villains. Now, this is the second half, so hopefully you watched the first half, and if you haven't, you need to go back and watch that so it'll all kind of fit together. But we've been talking about Judas, and so obviously Jesus is the hero and Judas is the villain. Um, Pam, can you kind of recap what we've been talking about? Okay, Jesus had many disciples and followers, but he carefully picked 12 that stayed with him for three years and learned from him. But one of them was not what he pretended to be. Mm -hmm. Judas Iscariot was a thief. And eventually his love of money led him to being part of a conspiracy to capture his own teacher. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. Okay. So we've already talked about how Jesus knew that all that was going to happen and mm -hmm. how I was so amazed that he could have the kind of restraint to still treat Judas well and love Judas and all that, knowing full well what was going on in Judas's heart. Um, in John 13, 18, uh, Jesus says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then, leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to the Lord, Lord, who is it? And Pam, pick up the story from there. Okay, Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately and it was night. Okay, Matthew gives another detail that to me just shows again how hypocritical Judas was. In Matthew 26, 25, we find this. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you said it. <laughs> like a dwarf. <laughs> it's just, I'm sorry. It just was such a ridiculously rude thing to say because he knew and Jesus knew, obviously. Oh, I know. And and every time um I read this, I'm I'm sort of like you, like, why would you even ask that question? Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus has just said, it's who I give the bread to, and he gave the bread to him. But um how could Judas do what he was going to do after Christ called him out? I mean, at that point, Judas had, shouldn't Judas have thought, well, I guess say, so the scripture tells us that Satan entered him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was going to say, shouldn't he have thought, oh, Jesus knows. Oh no, I better not do that. But by that <laughs> time it was too late. You know, Satan had gotten inside of him and and in just a minute, we're going to read the, the scripture from the book of John, who tells us the details of Christ being arrested. But before we do that, I want to pause to remember just how Jesus was feeling in the garden that night. Because, you know, a lot of times we think of Jesus being God, but we don't really think of him being man as we should. I mean, he was both. And so he's going to have all those same emotions of betrayal and hurt and all that that we would have. And he knew he was fulfilling scripture, but it still had to hurt. Um, so Matthew gives us a clear picture of really just how difficult it was for Jesus to go through this. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 39 and 42, we read of twice Jesus prays to God, asking for the cup to pass. And that's just another way of saying, don't, I don't want to do this. Don't make me do this. 
but he always ends it with Lord, thy will be done. Whatever God wanted, that's what Jesus wanted to do. And ladies, this was not an easy thing to do. Luke 22, 44 says it this way, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it, as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. And I've read different accounts uh, from doctors and such, and they say that the body literally could be under so much stress that like capillaries burst and, and blood could be mixed. I've heard other people say, no, it just meant the sweat was that deep, that much, you know, uh, it was that it was, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just literally like pouring like a wound would pour. Mm -hmm. So now let's look at John's account of this night. John gets right to the point. But I just felt we needed to fully understand the emotions of Jesus before we looked at his actions. So before we move on to that, um, wh what do you think about how Jesus felt there in the garden? What are your thoughts when you think about that scene? It's, it must have been overwhelming emotions because there's so many things going on. There's knowing that he's been betrayed by someone who he'd been so careful and caring about three years and thought of as a friend and, and he's getting this betrayal. He knows it's happening and why and how he knows that um, the last thing Judas did was to be hypocritical about it. He knows that he's only got a certain number of hours before he's going to be away from all of his disciples and alone and not able to talk to them anymore or teach them anymore. He knows that he's about to face more pain than he's ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And he knows just how lonely it's going to be. He knows how bad it is. And yet he's got to, he's got to dive in and deal with it. It's just horrible. I know when you, if, you know, the movie, um, was it the, what was that movie called? The Passion, Christ? What, the the Passion. Passion, Passion of the Christ. I have not been able to bring myself to watch that movie because, oh, I understand. <laughs> because I've been told that the betrayal and the, the, the way they did it, the beating and, and all of that through that whole scene that we're in the middle of and, and going to complete here in a little bit was so graphic and so on point that I, I just can't, maybe I need to, you know, maybe I need to fully mm -hmm. comprehend, but it, it hurts me to think of Jesus going through all of that. I, don't I bought the movie and I don't want to watch it again. I watched it the first time and the thought of watching it again is too much. Yeah, it's 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 bad. All right, John 18, uh, verses one through seven. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook of Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas have receiving a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And G Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. And when he said to them, I am he, he drew back and fell into the ground. Then, then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, I, I'm not sure I under, have a clear picture of what that means when it says that he, that they drew back and fell to the ground. Were those words so powerful that these armies literally backed up and fell over i mean what's do you have a thought on that well first it wasn't an army it was a mob they were riled up they were coming at night they were hungry for blood yes but i've always wondered too why they fell to the ground they certainly they certainly weren't seeing exactly what they expected to no. a man facing an angry mob should have been cowering in fear or trying to flee and jesus just stood up to them and calmly and firmly addressed them and identified himself maybe this stopped them in their tracks because they just didn't expect it. I, and I, I'm just awestruck, I guess. It's probably not the right word, but 
Judas didn't come alone. He mm -hmm. brought with him, as you said, a mob. But he was given, they came with chief priests and Pharisees who were the religious leaders of the day who should have been following and worshiping Jesus, but obviously were not. They brought with them lanterns and torches and weapons, all for one man. Mm -hmm. And then when he, as you said, stood up and said, here I am, they literally fell to the ground. And so even at that moment, Jesus' words are incredibly powerful. And as you said, not at all what they expected. And so uh, and verse, you know, three says that he received a detachment of troops, officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. So it literally was a mob and there wasn't some small group and they had come prepared to fight. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk in a little bit about, uh, well, in another lesson, we talked about all the people that were always following Jesus. So maybe Judas was afraid that because he had called him out there at the, at the last supper, that Jesus was going to be ready for a fight, but that's not, that's not what happened. He, right. um, they just said they fell to the ground. <clears throat> okay. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's look at Mark 14 verses 44 to 45. Now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now Luke twenty two forty eight gives us one more bit to that. It says, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? So somehow adding the insult to injury, that phrase, it just mm -hmm. keeps coming to mind when I read this story. Not only was Judas betraying him, but he was doing it with a sign of affection. Mm -hmm. This is that's just ridiculous. Yeah, I, 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 I'm bothered by that as well. And, and I thought about this over the years, and it has always bothered me that Judas betrayed Jesus because Judas was supposed to be a faithful follower and one of the closest men to Jesus. He was close to him in a personal way. But I think, you know, as I studied the, the story more, I realized that Satan took that weak spot that Judas had, his love for money, mm -hmm. and and really got in there and was got into his heart. And then once Judas's heart was hardened, he didn't care. You know, he was going to walk right up to the Savior and call him teacher. Isn't that what Rabbi uh, mm -hmm. means, teacher? And then kiss him. His heart was so hardened that he could betray someone he had seen do miracles. He had walked with and slept with and eaten with and traveled with. And yet he could walk up to him and kiss him. And like you said, it, it reminds me of the saying, it's like he's pouring salt into an open wound. Yeah. Well, All right. I'm, as Go we're going along with this, I'm also kind of conflicted in another way. There's a word that he uses when he's giving instructions to the mob and it's safely. I thought I think that's kind of interesting though. The kiss is seems just nothing but hypocrisy, but he did seem to have some concern when he asked them to do, to lead him away safely. That's true. I hadn't really picked up on that. Honey, it might not mean anything, but it might mean that he was conflicted in his feelings. And considering what's ha gonna happen next, yeah. he did have a lot of conflicting emotions about what he was doing. Yeah, I anyway. hadn't really picked up on the safely part, but you're right. I hadn't before, but just jumped out this time. This all that shows us how much Jesus understands of what we experience. When someone we trusted or loved does something hurtful to us, he, we know he can sympathize. He's been there, done that big time. And we all have that feeling and it hurts like crazy, but Jesus went through it so deeply. Yeah, he did. It's it's amazing what, what all Jesus has done for us. So, this is the end of Judas's crimes, but it's not the end of the story. As Jesus began the night of his trial, another Judas had a change of heart. Matthew tells us about it in chapter 27, verses 3 through 9. Then Judas, his betrayer, so I guess that is the same guy, his mm -hmm. betrayer 
um, seeing that he had been con condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Wow. So he's had a change of heart, but they certainly have it. Mm -mm. They didn't. You know, Dr. Luke gives us a little more detail to Judas's death. We always get a little medical stuff in Luke's com commentaries. Mm -hmm. In Acts 1, 18 and 19, he writes, Now this man, per meaning Judas, purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. But some people say the two passages about how he died are contradictory. But doctors and forensic experts have said that they just complete one another. Um, Judas went off to a, a solitary kind of place by himself to kill himself. And after hanging himself, his body probably wasn't discovered for some time. The tissues in his body would have gone through several different stages of decay. Gases would have built up inside it. Mm -hmm. And the tree limb or the rope could have broken from the weight or from rotting, the body would have fallen. And as it felt, it would likely have burst open. But the remorse and regret Judas felt are the most interesting part of what he did. He was so far gone that he could betray Jesus, but he was not so far gone that he couldn't feel regret about having done it. I, I, I struggle with my feelings for Judas. Not that my feelings have anything to do with it. <laughs> I'm not going to have a say-so in any of it. But he did repent after it was all done. And I think I said this last time is, I just wonder what would have happened if instead of killing himself, he had truly gone to God humbly asking for forgiveness. And of course, we'll never know because it didn't happen that way. Um, and, and the interesting part is everything that has happened was predicted. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of cool. Um, but Judas, I don't know. I, I'm glad that God is judging <laughs> and not me because, um, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm kind of torn over, over Judas. What he did is unforgivable, but yet God forgives me of a lot of things too. So I, you know, I don't know, but I, I want to focus right now on Jesus because it is hard for me to believe all that Christ did for me. And, and I think my challenge is when I read this story and when I talk about this story, that I don't see that as something that Christ did for someone else, but he did it for me because mm -hmm. I am a sinner. And he died, he died for all of us. And I think that, you know, we talked about villains and heroes and obviously he is a hero because a hero always puts the needs of other people first. Right. Um, he could have stopped it. He could have called the angels in to take him off the cross. He could have done a lot of things, but he didn't. He followed through with such humility. You know, even, even the words that we read on the cross about him asking God to forgive those that were right there who had done this terrible thing. Um, and I, I just, I'm just, the whole story, the whole account of what happened is mind blowing to me. I agree. I agree. It's just amazing. The contradictions there, you know, we know that God gives every human the choice to do right or to do wrong. Jesus died for everyone who's willing to accept the gift of salvation. But I've often thought about this as I read about Judas. When he realized his crime and regretted it, he had the option to repent. And I have to believe he could have received forgiveness. God's good about that. If your heart is right, he'll give it. He tried to undo his crime by giving the money back, but that didn't work. And he probably felt that he could not be forgiven. Mm -hmm. So he did the only thing he thought he could. I, you know, I've, I've met people uh, who truly believe that they have sinned to the point that God couldn't forgive them. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I, I think that this, the way Jesus handled this whole account, even that last interaction with Judas, you know, when he was kissing him and betraying him, shows us just what a loving, forgiving, gracious God we serve. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'd like, we all make mistakes. Um, and so I would really like to encourage all anyone that's listening to the sound of my voice to not take the route that Judas took. Don't give up. Don't, don't feel like it's, it's not fixable because God is the great physician and he can fix it. So, you know, that's one of the things the devil put in Judas too. And that puts in some of us, the idea that we can't be forgiven, mm -hmm. that it's, we're, it's too late. We're lost. And that's it. Cause he doesn't want us to go to God for anything, but God's been showing some amazing things all through history of how he could forgive yes. and how he can turn around for someone that's willing to repent. Um, the apostle Paul's in Migwin, you know, he'd been going after God's people trying to arrest and kill them. Mm -hmm. And he was forgiven and used for God's purposes. Um, there's a, everybody's heard of Jeffrey Dahmer, mm -hmm. who was such a horrible, horrible man, did such evil things. Oh, yeah. It's hard to imagine how horrible those things were that he did. Mm -hmm. And yet when he was in prison, um, he realized, he says, all of a sudden I knew that I didn't have to have done those things. I didn't know I had a choice when I was doing them. But when I couldn't do them anymore, I saw that I had a choice. And he was cleaning um, some sort of area of the, of the prison and found a thrown away Bible correspondence course in a wastebasket hmm. and pulled it out and, and read it and filled it out and sent it in. And he wound up studying the Bible with a um, member of the church and um, asked to be baptized, even though he told me, I know he can't forgive me. He shouldn't forgive me. I don't deserve to be forgiven, but I want to do what he wants me to do anyway. And so he was baptized. It's going to make a lot of people crazy if they realize that Jeffrey Donner could be in heaven, <laughs> especially those who are his victims or the families of his oh, victims. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want to forgive a person like that. Right. Uh, we don't want him to be sorry and, and come for forgiveness. And yet God can forgive him. God can forgive anybody if their heart is sincere. So Judas could have done it. But the main thing is for everybody else to understand, there is nothing so bad that you can do that God can't forgive it if you're willing to change. And we just don't give him credit for that, how much power there is in his ability to love and forgive. It's an amazing God that we serve. Yes. And, and you're right. Um, I had heard that he had uh, been, you know, been baptized and is now trying to live for the Lord. Oh, no, he's dead now. Oh, he's dead now. Okay. But I had he not. Did, how how long after the baptism did he pass? Do you know? I don't know how long. It wasn't too long, but other other prisoners killed him. Oh. Okay. Well, I see. Obviously, I didn't didn't know much of that story other than he had become a Christian. And, and I thought about that before. And that's, that's amazing. You know, that, that, but you're right. I mean, there will be people that I've always said that the judgment scene, everybody's surprised. You know? <laughs> yeah. the, the, you know, there are some that said, Lord, when did we do all those wonderful things for you? And, and the other part, and they were going to heaven and the other half were like, wait a minute, we did do wonderful things for you. And Jesus says, I don't know who you are. And mm -hmm. so uh, it, like you said, it all goes back to the heart and um, making sure that we're following what, what God wants us to do. And that kind of leads us to the first, you know, I always like to do the, uh, what can we learn? That kind of leads us to the first thing that I saw is that scripture will be fulfilled. We are to do what the Lord says, and he knew what was going to happen. And so everything that we read last week and we read today, every bit of that was foretold in scripture. Mm -hmm. And the Bible is the, is the true word of God, and we should trust it. And it's kind of interesting to me that the more scientists discover, the more it simply proves the truth of scripture. Uh, and also love the stories about um, atheists that go out to prove that there is no God only to be converted themselves of the truth of scripture. And so, you know, we've got that, that prediction or the Old Testament, they had that prediction of Jesus coming. 
and in dying and being raised. We today have a prediction that there will come a judgment day and there is a heaven and there is a hell. And it just kind of boggles my mind that there are people that believe that Jesus did come and, you know, Christmas time, everybody loves the baby Jesus story. And then there are those that truly believe that he raised from the dead, but they don't follow it through and, and be convinced that there will come a day that we all stand before the throne of God and will answer for everything that we've done and everything that we didn't do that we should have. And so, you know, if we believe the Bible is accurate in one area, shouldn't that connect so that you believe it's accurate in all areas? I don't well, know. People think, people think of the Bible as a smorgasbord. Mm. You know, you pick what you want to off the plate and that's you know, all you take is that bit that you're interested in. And that's one way a lot of people are going to wind up without salvation. Who think Half because I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pick and show something want that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, the second thing that I saw as we, as you and I were studying this together, and, and that is that sin has consequences. When we sin, it's often that we are seeing the benefit that it's going to give to us. We see mm -hmm. the, the, maybe the sexual pleasure or the power, uh, or maybe the, the possessions that we desire, or maybe we like the idea that, um, we build ourselves up and our ego gets a little bit bigger. But like Judas, we're not considering the devastation that sin will cause. Mm -hmm. And and oftentimes that destruction can't be fully mended. Uh, you know, as you said a minute ago, Jeffrey repented, but that did not bring back those people that he had killed mm -hmm. and, and, and horribly mutilated. It did not mend the hearts of those that were grieving those people and the trauma that they went through their family and whatever the damage is done and sometimes those consequences can be very harsh you know there are some sins that that maybe we can get by with quote unquote um because they don't cause tremendous consequences but there are other sins that, that the consequences just can even go from one generation to the next and mm -hmm. so how we feel about it really doesn't change that. You know, Judas was remorseful. He went and gave the money back. He was sorry he had done what he had done. But that didn't change the fact that Jesus was going to hang on the cross. Right. And so whenever we are tempted to sin, we need to remember that Satan is going to show us the shiny, glittery, you know, appealing thing. But he's not going to show us the long-term consequences that that whatever that temptation to sin is, and if we do it, what that's going to bring. And that's the cool part to me about God is that scripture not only tells us what to do, but he tells us what's going to happen when we do it. He mm -hmm. talks about the, the rewards we're going to have and the blessings we're going to have and the peace that passes all understanding and having God there to listen and, and Christ there to advocate for us. And the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We're given the big picture, but mm -hmm. Satan doesn't give the big picture. He oh, no. only wants you to see that, that one little part that, oh, you can make lots of money or you can have lots of power. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't show us the devastation that it's going to cause. So we need to remember that. Yes. All right. I guess you don't have anything else to add on that. So I'll move right along. You're pretty thorough. Go ahead. I know. I get to roll. I get on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> the third, third and last thing that I saw as we studied this, it really stuck out to me is that Jesus loves us. If you don't believe that Christ loves you, study this story and think about the immense power that the Son of God had. And yet he went through it all for us. You know, as you said, Judas's betrayal was such a personal thing. And yet Jesus still followed through and he did, you know, scripture tells us that he never sinned. And when Judas, if I had been Jesus and when Judas walked up and kissed me, I, I don't think a normal person could have reacted the way Jesus did. It took the son of God 
to have mm-hmm. that kind of strength to uh, not want to push back. <laughs> Or step away. <laughs> or step away, yes, or disappear. I mean, there are, there are times that Christ disappeared into the crowd. He could have done that. And so I just want to leave everyone today with a thought that God is a loving father. He gave his son Jesus for us. Jesus went through all of that for us. And let the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of every Christian who's been baptized for the remission of their sins. And so, again, I just want to say, Take this story to heart and don't be like Judas. Don't feel like you can't be forgiven, but come back to God and ask for forgiveness because our loving Savior, he does forgive. Yes, praise God. And he is our hero. (laughs) And our only hope. And our only hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Did you have anything else you wanted to add before we close out our time today? No, it's just a really sad story. Just Judas's life was just pathetic. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it weird, though, that it's it's a sad story and yet it's a hopeful story? Mm-hmm. Because without those things coming to pass, we wouldn't have what we have today. And so it's... um. I I don't know. I just think it's one more proof that the Bible wasn't just written by a bunch of men. It had to be inspired because this is not a story that man would have made up. You know, Mm -hmm. the the story would have been, you know, Jesus did something to stop Judas in some way. Um, It would have been a last minute rescue. Yeah. 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 But that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. He gave his life for us. And I am eternally grateful. Me too. All right, ladies. Well, we hope you enjoyed meeting with Pam and me today. We always enjoy being with you. And please come back next time for the Your Love Ministry podcast because you just never know what we're going to be talking about. That's true. Have a blessed day.